Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's session, which is the finale of the startup. And we've had the chance throughout the semester to see teams, uh, startup ventures at the University of Michigan grow and develop uh, through mentorship and training and through focused progress, uh, connecting with customers and validating their business model. And today is the finale of uh, that process and a great opportunity for us to, to see uh, their progress throughout this semester. Uh, the winner of today's competition will receive $15,000, and so we're super excited to have an opportunity to, to be a part of that. After round three, um, the teams that are involved in the startup uh, had a workshop with Wes Huffstutter, who is a, a very strong advocate for student entrepreneurs and also a very successful entrepreneur himself. And so uh, they worked together on finding ways that they could gain traction for their business, and today, uh, each team is going to have six minutes uh, to present to you, share their progress, really show that they have uh, real progress and traction and not just vanity metrics. What we're looking for, as you can see up here, is uh, their journey. Have they validated their business model? Do they understand the challenges that are ahead of them? Have they started to develop some traction? Are they able to scale? And do they have the determination to do it? Uh, what we're looking for is, of course, uh, the best real startup, not just vanity metrics, uh, not just uh, who looks the slickest, but who has the best real startup. Um, after, the, uh, after the teams present, we'll then have four minutes for questions uh, from a guest panel of judges who we'll be introducing with you uh, today. Uh, these judges are a great opportunity for these teams to get to meet with other uh, really amazing people who can help them in their startup journey. And they also will be casting their vote along with you to determine which team is uh, the startup at the University of Michigan. And so now the slide's gone, but that's okay. Um, previous to this, the teams uh, shared their progress videos on YouTube, and part of the scoring for today is is based on how many likes that they got on their videos, and that's 20% of the scoring. 40% of their score is based on the guest judges' votes, and 40% of the outcome is based on your votes. So um, with that, we'll then have the winner take all, $15,000 check to support their venture. And so let's now welcome our mentors. Our first mentor, Bill Mayer. And we also have today with us Jared Stasek, who's standing in uh, for Jake Cohen. I also mentioned that today we have our guest judges, and so I'd like to introduce them to you as well. Today we have with us Wes Huffstutter, who's a successful entrepreneur, whose company, Wes, welcome Wes. His company, Quad Metrics. Uh, was recently acquired by FICO and became the FICO score for cyber risk. I'd like to welcome Hirak Parikh. Welcome, Hirak. Hirak is a neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and he's currently the fund manager for the Monroe Brown Seed Fund at the University of Michigan. Let's now welcome Paula Sorrell. Paula is the former Vice President of Entrepreneurship, Innovation, and Venture Capital for the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. She's currently the Director at the University of Michigan's Institute for Research on Labor, Employment, and the Economy. Let's welcome Doug Neal. Welcome, Doug. Doug is the former Executive Director at the University of Michigan Center for Entrepreneurship. He's a serial entrepreneur, he's an educator, he's an investor, board member, co-founder, partner, and now he is currently the managing director of Elab Ventures. And finally, let's also welcome our good friend, Tom Frank. Tom Frank is also a former director at the Center for Entrepreneurship. He's a Silicon Valley startup advisor and uh, turn turnaround CEO. He's worked for companies like Procter & Gamble and Dick Clark Productions and a whole slew of other companies that have done some amazing things. And he's back here from the Bay Area to join us uh, for the startup. So let's welcome again our mentors and our guest judges today.
So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first venture today, Morning Brew. Good afternoon, everyone. Over the past three weeks, Morning Brew has made a ton of progress in reaching our goal of better connecting the future leaders of business with the business world. First, our daily email business newsletter has continued to grow rapidly, and we just hit 127,000 subscribers while maintaining our high open rate. This past Monday, we had our best growth day ever with over 2,000 subscribers in a single day. With all this growth, we've been able to bring in those lucrative advertising deals I've spoken about in the past couple of pitches. For April alone, we have secured over $38,000 in advertising revenue. And these past two weeks, we ran a very successful advertising campaign with Casper, and we have many other similar campaigns coming up in the pipeline. Additionally, over the past few weeks, we have secured $350,000 of funding, and we plan on closing the round of $650,000 by June 1st. And then finally, we hired our first-time employee, Graham Rapier, who will be our full-time head of content. Graham has experience working at Inc.com, and his expertise will help take Morning Brew's content to the next level. So obviously, we've been up to a ton the past couple of weeks, and I want to give you a little sneak peek into what we have coming up and what we have in store and how we plan on taking this email newsletter and turning it into a full content company. So the first thing we're doing with the help of our head of content is we are doing a brand and newsletter redesign to ensure the highest quality product on a daily basis. And this will help us to create a identifiable and trustable brand that we can leverage in so many different ways. Then we are building out our website from its current landing page state to a full content website, which will allow content to seamlessly flow from the newsletter to the website and then through social media. While we understand that this will be our biggest challenge to date, we have brought on many investors and mentors who themselves have, bolt, have built out multi-million dollar content platforms and they will help us through this challenge. And then finally, this summer, we plan to expand into video content, which will be created in the same conversational and witty tone that the newsletter is written in. So with all the growth we've had over the past couple of months and everything we're planning going forward, we aim to hit our 2017 goals of $350,000 of revenue, 300,000 subscribers, and 650,000 daily impressions across all of our platforms. And now I'd like to share with you our video so you can get a little bit better of a taste about Morning Brew. All started with a simple but massive problem impacting the lives of young business minds across the world. In this age of rapidly evolving technology, our generation's consumption is changing just as quickly. Companies large and small have failed to keep us engaged and connected with relevant content and information. In Brew's case, that content is business news. And those companies are the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and the Financial Times, to name a few. What started as a daily roundup for my five college roommates has evolved into a generational movement of more than 125,000 young business minds. Along the way, we've created relationships with advisors in Silicon Valley, investors on Wall Street, and Fortune 500 media executives. We've secured long-term advertising deals with multi-billion dollar financial institutions. And this year, we hired our first full-time employee and plan to hire even more. But there is so much more to be done. We are making business news more engaging, more educational and more understandable. And we will become the one-stop shop that millennials think of when it comes to the business world. Further, the brew is a lifestyle, not just a company. We are creating a better and more exciting conversation around business. And we invite you to be a part of this discussion with us and the hundreds of thousands more.
I believe that the Morning Brew has the ability to become a massive multimedia company, but I personally love it because of its witty tone and succinct format. It's digestible yet comprehensive. It's relatable yet professional. Morning Brew is going to take the world by storm. What makes it unique is the fact that not only does it show up easily and convenient, but you want to read it. You want to get more of it. And that's something that I've heard from every single person that I have shared Morning Brew with here at Ohio State. I love the brew because it makes keeping up to date easy. It's witty and it's much more than just a newsletter. It's a community. I believe the Morning Brew is the future of, of business news simply because it reads in a very conversational tone. It's almost like I'm talking to another person. Every morning on my commute, I'm reading the brew. It doesn't seem like homework. It's easy. It's not talking heads. I get my news in a nice, enjoyable way. I love Morning Brew because it keeps me up to date on the most important business news. It has a great sense of humor and it comes right to my email inbox every single morning. I love the fact that it's fun, it's accessible enough for millennials, but at the same time, it's sophisticated enough for seasoned uh, business people. I, I really do believe that the Morning Brew is the future of business news. That's it, all right, fantastic. Now, I, I could have sworn I saw a testimonial from Ohio State in there, was that? I didn't, that, that's impressive progress right there. Jared, uh, Jake, and, and uh, you worked with this team uh, over the past several months. Is there anything you want to add before we open it up to questions? That was going to be my comment, that he convinced the Buckeye already. So, I mean, that's pretty, pretty impressive traction. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, no, really, it's, it's just been really impressive to see. Uh, obviously, I haven't been here the whole time. Jake has, but he's sort of building up the progress. And just seeing the growth from January, February, March, April, your numbers to date, it's, it's very impressive. So we're, uh, we're, we're proud of you, and we'll take absolutely no credit. Although if Jake were here, he'd probably charge people credit, but I won't call you. All right, Thank you. fantastic. Okay, from our guest judges, comments, questions. Uh, great, great presentation. Thank uh, you. The, the question I have is about the growth, and how much do you know about what's driving the growth? What data do you have from your audience in terms of what do they like the most? How are the increases coming in? Are they new? Are they word of mouth? What kind of data are you gathering? Yeah, so that's what we've been working a ton of, we've just been spending a lot of our time on. Uh, we brought on an investor who's a PhD in uh, marketing and data analytics. And so we're in the process of setting up an internal database that tracks everything uh, where users came from. Currently, we have some of that tracking technology. So we know what percent of our subscribers come from shares. So when we run sharing competitions, we can understand uh, you know, what our customer acquisition cost is. Uh, we're, we're branching out into Facebook ads and, and things like that. And so we'll be able to track that as well. And our number one growth driver and where most of the traffic has come from has been our ambassador programs and just having students like you saw in this video, being able to share the brew and you know, get a resume builder while they're sharing and spreading our community. So it looks like much of your success is going to hinge on ad revenue. Uh, in the short term, the plan is ad revenue, but we do have ideas for other revenue models down the road. We don't anticipate always being ad-based. Okay, and I was curious, what, what kind of trends are you seeing in the industry for ad revenue for, for news content that will continue? Yeah, so uh, the advertising space has been really interesting recently, uh, but we think we're in a really good position because the advertising agencies and companies we talk to are looking to target companies who are hitting a niche demographic. So they don't want to advertise in companies like, uh, or they're less likely to advertise in companies like a business insider that reaches out to pretty much everyone and has pretty clickbaity content. They're looking for quality content and people who have uh, audience's attention for a longer period of time than just uh, a five or 10 second list. And so that's why email advertising dollars have gone up recently because it's a community and you have people's attention for three or four minutes as opposed to a 10 second web page. So you mentioned your open rate, but what's your churn? Yeah, so our churn is really low, significantly less than 1% in a month. So we're looking at like 0.25% a month. And at what point do people age out of your content or have you maintained your churn? I mean, have you maintained that churn rate throughout the, the yes. So yeah, we, we've maintained a very similar churn rate as we continue to grow. One exciting thing that we've noticed is that 
people, we expected people to churn as they graduate and go into the workforce, and we've actually seen the opposite. We've seen a ton of people spread brew when they get to work at their financial institution or management consulting firm, and the brew is spread like very fast all throughout these, uh, these analyst programs because it's such a good and quick way to get your business news. All right, thank you, Morning Brew. Let's now welcome our next startup, Kalisha. Cool. So hi everyone, I'm Eric and I'm here to present Kulisha. Just a reminder, what we're doing with Kulisha is we're developing a shipping container that we can put on site of food and beverage processors. We take their organic waste and we feed that to insects. Now why this is so cool is because ordinarily they're paying a lot of money just to unsustainably send this to landfills. And we're able to convert that using insects into a high value protein source. Now our journey really started because of our passion for marine conservation. Um, so before I talk about our journey, I first want to show you guys this video about why we're so passionate about what we do. It turns out that the way farmers currently feed livestock is pretty fishy. Quite literally, most animal feeds, including fish feeds, are made from smaller fish like anchovies. Catching these anchovies is destroying our oceans. In fact, 90% of our fisheries are exploited and a third of all fish go towards making animal feed. If we are to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050, we simply need a new solution. And that's where we come in. I'm Maya. And I'm Viraj. And we're seniors at Brown University studying environmental studies. And I'm Eric, a business student at the University of Michigan. And together we're Kulisha, a company changing the way we look at waste and produce food. We offer a sustainable, high protein alternative to traditional fish meal for use in animal feeds. Our solution? Well, that's one bug with a big appetite for your scraps. Meet the black soldier fly, one of the world's hungriest creatures and least picky eaters. As larvae, these guys consume all sorts of organic waste voraciously. Grown and harvested while still in the larval stage, these bugs become perfect grub for livestock. Not only are they hungry, they're also rich in protein and are totally safe. In July of 2016, they became the first insects to be approved for commercial sale in North America. And because black soldier fly larvae feed off of organic material, they also provide a new use for the huge amounts of organic waste generated by restaurants, breweries, and large food producers. We partner with food and beverage companies, take their organic waste into our Kulisha system, where our black soldier fly larvae eat it and are then harvested as a sustainable protein to replace fish meal and animal feeds. We're working with some of the world's leading experts in black soldier fly to develop an algorithm that completely automates our process. Our sensors collect data in real time, and our algorithm maximizes efficiency. As the world's population rapidly increases, we are determined to feed people while reducing pressure off of ocean ecosystems. And we're going to do it, one black soldier fly at a time. But we need your help. In June, we'll be partnering with our very first brewery to build our first pilot facility and grow some bugs. But we need to raise an additional $40,000 for equipment like bins and sensors, dryers and packages. We hope you'll join us in making this a reality. So this is the world's leading black soldier fly bio biologist. He's on the cusp of innovation in this industry. And he started a company called Evo. And what Evo has done is identified a bacteria that you insert, you inoculate your feedstock, your waste with, and actually cuts the amount of time it takes to grow black soldier fly from 18 days to nine days. It's an incredibly innovative technology. And what we're able to do is we formed a formal partnership with him, the first people to do so. And why we're able to do that and utilize, have full access to this technology at no cost is because we're also on the cusp of innovation. We're creating a, oh, uh, so we're creating a hardware component, and that tracks key biological data. Now, why that's so important is because we're able to analyze that data and then create a fully automated, decentralized system. That means anybody producing large amounts of organic waste can now become a black soldier fly producer, completely transforming the industry. Now, the way that our system works is we work with these food and beverage processors. They pay a one-time cost that covers the cost 
that covers the cost of the container of $30,000. Now that's peanuts for them. That's just over one year of what they're currently paying in disposal fees. But the true value for both of us is what comes out of that container. It's called black soldier fly, uh, black soldier fly larva, and it's an incredible insect that's one of the most worlds, it's extremely efficient at converting organic waste into pure protein, and it's not a vector for disease. Because this is an extremely nutritionally dense insect, it can fetch a high value on the animal feed market. So one container can generate over $100,000 in products over the course of the year. And that's at a 30% or 70% gross margin, and 10% of that profit we give back to the company. So why this is so cool is because we're essentially enabling anybody producing organic waste to do this by aligning our financial incentives. So it's an investment for them with just a four-year payback period and a tw an almost 13% 10-year annualized ROI. Um, also, we've reached, we've had incredible progress so far. So we've been able, besides attracting the world's most prominent black soldier fly researcher, we've been able to raise over $200,000 in completely non-dilutive funding by winning some of the world's most prestigious food security competitions. We've also have a fully functional pilot facility and hardware component here at the University of Michigan. And we're currently in talks with two breweries to bring a commercial system and a person to buy all of our, um, all of our insects. Now, uh, we're extremely excited about our next steps. We're talking with a brewery right now in Austin, Texas, um, to bring our first system in July. Now, this is what they currently have. A truck pulls up, the waste gets dumped, and it gets taken away. Now, imagine a Kalisha shipping container right there, taking all the waste, and it's not a little bit. They're generating 90,000 pounds of waste a week, and that's a microbrewery. Now, in terms of our challenges, our biggest challenge is gonna be working towards automating the system. But besides all the attention we've attracted, we've also attracted an incredible amount of attention from, from the state of Michigan. We were selected for the Small Company Innovation Program, receiving a $40,000 grant to be able to continue um, working with the University of Michigan Engineering Department and Texas A&M's Entomology Department to create this automation technology. Now, this is a revolution, and it's here right now. Thank you. All right. Black flies have never looked so good. Bill, do you have anything to add? All right, you're getting my full commendation. We hammered you, not just me, but you got hammered on your client economics. You did a great job showing the revenue stream will motivate people. So you guys are a very coachable team. You've done the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Guest judges, comments? First of all, first of all congratulations. This is the first company that I've seen that actually produces manure and asks for money straight up with a straight face. That's great, thank you. Uh, the question I have for you is, um, the reason why companies truck this stuff out is that they produce a lot of it, like you said, 90,000 90, tons, so how fast can the black soldier fly eat this stuff? Yeah, so one container, I have a slide in a question there, but I'll just leave, so one container can process 300 uh, tons of organic waste a year. Um, so that means one microbrewery, the biggest microbrewery that would be using our solution would need at most three containers. Uh, most microbreweries would just need one container. Yeah, one of these things. There we go. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, part of this is, is the, the buying container, but there's a second revenue stream of the protein. How is that extracted? And, and how, does it, how do you go about monetizing that? Yeah, so it's, it's really easy to extract. You just sift it um, and dry it. And then, so how we monetize that is we don't want to occupy the branding, but what it's sold is is a specialty chicken treat. So there's a huge market of backyard chicken farmers that are looking for treat products for their chickens. Um, so what we do is we then sell that to an organic feed retailer. They then package it um, and distribute it through their, exact, through their existing retail network, and it fetches anywhere between $12 and $15 per pound. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there's no potential for a snafu to create a plague of flies through this. <laughs> there actually is. <laughs> but anyways, we'll... <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I, what have you heard from your potential customers about um, the tolerance for a four-year payback? Yeah, so um, they've been pretty open to it at least, and we might have a little biased perspective, but lots of the breweries that we've been talking with really started um, brewing before this huge influx of microbreweries, so they're pretty long-term thinkers. They've been really open to the idea, especially because um, 
they're currently paying this like annual fee to just send it to a landfill, and they're pretty environmentally conscious. Um, they realize that their customers are too. So they actually view it as they're not counting on us, but they think that they could potentially tie it into their marketing and be like, all of our waste is going to produce a sustainable protein. And maybe even serve it with, but we called it bugs and brews. <laughs> Could you describe your target? I mean, you mentioned breweries as one, but what is the ideal feedstock for these uh, insects? It is brewery waste. Um, so we're really heavily targeting breweries at first. Um, the target market is any food or beverage processor that's producing homogenous organic waste. So breweries are the best because they're producing tons of spent grains. Um, slaughterhouses are also good. Um, vegetable uh, processors are also good. Um, but, but breweries definitely have the highest protein, most homogenous and consistent waste production from what we've found so far. I, I don't understand what you need to pilot. I mean, if you know that you can grow the bugs and you know that you're cheaper than landfills, what are you piloting? Yeah, so what we're piloting is, so our, our pilot, when I say pilot, what I mean is developing out automation technology. We've already piloted it and proved out the concept. But what we haven't done is done it at a large enough scale to collect enough data to be able to work towards automating. Um, and we also haven't had the resources to bring on a team of industrial engineers to work towards automating. So by doing that at scale, on site, where we're actually learning from our partner, you know, entrepreneurship, as we learn here, is all about like testing and learning and growing. Um, so working directly with a partner to actually know what it's like to take their waste. Um, and then to have the resources to be able to bring on an engineer to work towards automating that is what this pilot that we're referring to is. All right, thank you. One more clip. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let's welcome our next startup, AimTech. Welcome, AimTech. Hello, I'm Austin, a biomedical engineering student working with AIMTech. And I'm Dannon, an MS MBA here at Michigan. Some of you are probably wondering why you're seeing new faces up here, and that is because today is a really big day for AIMTech. We are not only here at the startup, we are also in Texas pitching at an investment competition and also up in northern Michigan uh, showing our technology to over 500 respiratory therapists. So first, just a quick reminder as to um, what we're going up against. And this is that every year, one million infants die of respiratory illness. 99% of those are in low and middle income countries. That makes this the leading cause of death in children under the age of five worldwide. Our solution is Neovent, an award-winning patent pending technology um, that is not only affordable, it is also easy to use, and it does not require consistent access to electricity. And that is key in some of the markets that we are going for. It working. Um, so during this time and process at the startup, uh, we are really building our business plan. And I want to highlight three key areas that we've had advancement in. Namely, customers, uh, marketing, and manufacturing. So looking first at customers, last time we said that we are actually going to sell directly to hospitals, physicians, and respiratory therapists. Recently, we've also targeted 10 countries in um, the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Africa that could really benefit from use of Neovent in their hospitals. These 10 countries represent 26,000 potential hospitals and annual revenue of over $100 million. So how are we gonna actually get Neovent into these markets? We are selling directly um, wholesale to distributors. We've been in contact with multiple distributors and are talking directly to two CEOs. Lastly, manufacturing. Um, thanks to Scott, who is not here, but congratulations on his new baby. Um, he put us in touch with some local manufacturers right here in Michigan. In the past month, we got um, three different quotes and are on the verge of contracting with one of them. Thanks, Dannon. So, uh, Dan has told you about our business model. I want to tell you about our upcoming milestones. You might remember that in a few weeks, we'll be launching our first pilot study in Nepal to test Neovent on 20 to 40 infants. Actually, this past week, we've been 3D printing the Neovents we need to ship to Nepal at the end of this month. We've also been talking with the nurses and doctors at the hospital where we'll be conducting the pilot to be sure they're ready to kick off the study. Now, after the Nepal study, our next, uh, our next steps include an even larger study in Malawi. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, our even larger clinical study in Malawi this fall, 
refining the NeoVents design, and achieving regulatory approval for the device so that we can start selling it in 2018. Now, we know that this, this is not going to be easy, and I want to highlight two big challenges that we foresee. The first is we need our clinical studies in Nepal and Malawi to go well to get proof that NeoVent is both safe and effective. Um, fortunately, for the, both of these studies, we'll be working with world-class physicians and re researchers here at Michigan and from Johns Hopkins University. The second big challenge is funding. It's really expensive to bring a medical device to market. We anticipate that over the next year, we'll need over $1 million to get to our first sales in Nepal. Um, for this big challenge, you are in a position to help us. If we win the top $15,000 prize today, those funds will go directly towards manufacturing the neovents we need for the Malawi study. In closing, I want to leave you with a short video that shows you what we've accomplished so far and what our hopes are for the future. Thank you. I'm Stephen, and I'm a co-founder of AIMTech. Growing up in Nepal and volunteering at a local hospital, I saw firsthand the problem of infants dying in respiratory distress. As I grew older, I learned that this wasn't just a problem in Nepal, and that over one million infants were dying every year due to respiratory illness, 99% in low to middle resource countries. Many times, this is because they don't have access to proper respiratory therapy. So we sought to develop a low cost, easy to use, no power ventilator, and Neovent was born. Over the last few years, we've been working hard to get Neovent to those infants in respiratory distress. Our team has traveled over 100,000 miles and talked with thousands of clinicians in settings like Nepal, India, and Kenya. We've networked by presenting our device at conferences like the Gate Foundation's Global Health Meeting. Over the last couple of months, we've been refining our device design based on preclinical testing in mannequins, infant lung simulators, and preterm lambs. On the business side, we've defined our marketing and distribution strategy, and we're in discussion with partners here in the States and abroad. We've been blessed with some great recognition. A write-up on NeoVent was accepted for publication in a leading ventilation journal. We've won first place in four national design competitions, including the Lemelson MIT and James Dyson Awards, and we're honored to reach the finals in the startup. Our journey definitely doesn't end with the finals today. In just a few weeks, we'll kick off our first in-human clinical pilot in Nepal, and then we'll be getting ready for our larger study in Malawi, which we hope to show that the NeoVent is safe and effective. We're excited to bring NeoVent to market, hopefully within the next year, and bring affordable, easy to use, and high quality respiratory therapy to infants in need. With your help, we hope to save lives one breath at a time. Thank you. We should also note that part of the funds will go to developing a better clicker. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> For your first question, yes, the NeoVent is a one connection add-on to a bubble CPAP system. The bubble CPAP is the current solution that's used in low-income countries. That solution, that bubble CPAP can only provide one level of pressure, which cannot help babies that need this dual pressure ventilation. Our device provides this dual pressure ventilation. So your market is limited to those hospitals in low-income countries that already have a BCPAP, right? Those would be some of our target hospitals and countries that already have bubble CPAP systems. Um, in regards to your second question about electricity, so our device runs on a source of airflow, or uh, basically we need a device that sends air into the, into the piping to the NeoVent. You can use electricity to send this. You can also use a compressed air tank. So for a lot of these hospitals, they'll have compressed air tanks that can provide airflow. If they use those, they will not need, need electricity. So, um, great presentation. My question is around more the, um, uh, the, the, the other failures that have happened in bringing medical devices to developing countries, right? What have you learned from looking at all of the other failures and really trying to go to market? Because going to direct to hospital is one way, but there's lots of people who've tried that. Absolutely. Um, so what we've learned in this is we definitely need to keep it low tech and easy to teach and implement. We've also learned that local on the ground partners are crucial. Um, one of our main advocates and partners has actually been respiratory therapists without borders. So they're on the ground in these developing markets and can help us um, look at how these can best be implemented and where they can best be implemented. In addition, um, Harak, your question on getting these out there, some of our distributors, they are already selling, as you said, um, these products that we would add on to. So as their market expands, so would ours. All right, 30 seconds for one last question. W define low cost for me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the last word. Low cost what? What is low cost? What, you, you said it's low cost, but you haven't said, in, in, your competitors are at 40K. What is, what is low cost? Yeah, definitely. So we plan on selling our device for, it, it depends on the country because they have a slightly different markets for this device. We plan on selling it for about 50 to $100. Um, and our retailers will probably mark that up by 30 or 40 percent. Um, is this single use or multiple use? It, we will design it to be used uh, for at least four patients. We know that in a lot of these health, low-income health care um, uh, situations that they would like to use devices for multiple patients in order to treat more people. So we want to, de we're designing it right now to be used for, by four patients. And you right. looked at quite a few countries in terms of the regulatory environment in each of them. Are they very similar? Uh, usually the answer is almost always no. The regulatory environments are different. Um, right now, we're going for a 510K. Um... All right. Yes. Thank you, AIMTECH. <laughs> and now let's welcome our last uh, startup of the day, Go Local. All right, well, hey, everybody, we are Go Local, and we are excited to be back with you today. And you know today that we're here to talk to you about our journey, and we've really accomplished a lot in the start, through the startup. And perhaps the most fundamental thing that we've been able to validate is our idea. Through extensive customer discovery, we know that there's a pain point for travelers, and with an incredibly fragmented market, there's currently no easy solution. Building on this customer discovery with extensive research, we've also been able to validate who our customers are. We know we'll start by targeting millennials because they already get their travel information through apps and they value experiences over anything else. But we also discovered that there's a huge untapped market for baby boomers. Nowadays, their idea of vacation is not a senior citizen cruise. They have the interest, the time, and the money for authentic travel experiences. In addition, we've been able to validate our revenue model. Now, we did almost 200 surveys to establish consumer willingness to pay. Then, working with companies like Uber, we took industry best practices to determine that we'll take a 10% cut of all of our transaction fees. And while that alone would give us a solid revenue model for our core business product, when we worked with Expedia, we discovered something interesting. There is an incredibly valuable sublayer to go local, and that's the back-end data that shows us consumption behaviors from our users. So all those factors considered, there is a $2.1 billion addressable market in the United States alone, and that doesn't account for the opportunity for international expansion. And finally, through this process, we were able to, com to complete a robust launch strategy for the city of Detroit, our first target market. And the exciting thing here is that we already have six hosts signed up, 
and more than 100 people pre-registered. And then working with Google, we've been able to drop our cost per acquisition by 84%. It was nearly $250. We've brought that down to 40. So lean startup strategy tells us to first learn from your data, then build. That's where we're at. We've established a solid business and we validated it. Now it's time to build Go Local, which brings us to our important next milestones. The first thing on our target is to source our app development and build Go Local 1.0. And here it's exciting because the, it's incredibly low risk. All of the technology we need to do this already exists in the market. And we're currently in conversations with several prospective partners to determine who's the best fit to help us bring our product to reality. And then the second step is to launch the app and start hosting Detroit tours. I mentioned we've already got six hosts on board. That number is growing. 100 people pre-registered, that number is also growing. So from where we stand, we have a clear path to market. Now, all we need is the help and the resources of the startup to help us put this into reality. And because Go Local is all about giving our users a behind the scenes look at their destination, we want to leave you with a behind the scenes look of our journey. Ming had actually roped me in to take a survey about travel preferences. I, my first unofficial meeting, um, I met Ming at Dominic's. From there, I kept on texting him with all of my ideas. Did you try this? Um, Ming had this idea. Have you thought of partnering with these people? He kind of gave me the elevator pitch. Go Local started uh, when I had this idea of trying to bring authentic travel to everybody. My name is Melina and I am VP of Marketing at Go Local. My name is Katie and I'm VP of Community and Communications. Ming Dale and President and VP of Tech at Go Local. My name is Dan Dwyer and I am VP of Finance at Go Local. We saw the startup application and we didn't see it until maybe a week before it was due. A few nights before it was due, we were like, should we do this? Do we have enough time to do this? And um, one of our team members was just, just like, yes, we have to do it this year. We're going to go for it. It's been discovery for our company as a whole. An absolute amazing experience. I'm just so impressed by the talent on our team. I'm so impressed with how we're relentless. I'm most proud of what this group has been able to achieve. A few months ago we were just an idea at a sushi joint and now we are getting incorporated and we're making all of these moves become a real entity. Having a very clear uh, idea on what we want to be. When I heard we made it to the final round I was like Whoa! So we were the last name called. We were the fourth one. I knew we could do it. I always had faith that we could do it. And when they called our name, I, I, my jaw just dropped. I hugged Ming. Congratulations to those advancing to the finale of the startup. Great job and to all these teams. And we just kept on looking at each other and saying, oh my gosh, we made it, we made it. I think our customer discovery really helped us realize that there is a need for this. Go Local will succeed because it's a real problem. It's perfect timing with the market. There's a definite need in the market. Everybody wants to have an amazing trip and an amazing um, um, time on vacation. With the money that we're going to win from the startup, we'll be able to make those next steps that we've been dying to make for the last two months, but just really haven't had the funding to do it. Winning the startup would give us not just the money that we need, but the resources we need to take our next step. I think it's going to be a point of validation for the idea and for the company. You know, the recognition hopefully will help us attract institutional funding, which we sorely need. Thank you everybody for the help, the support, the guidance. To all my family and friends, thank you so much for your loving support over the last six months. Thank you, Bill, for um, all your advice um, and your um, network connection in the Ann Arbor area. And a huge thank you to everyone in the audience. Thank you for voting us in last round, for taking a chance on us and thank you for your support along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Excellent job, Go Local. Bill, any quick comments? Thank you, Bill, and thank you for all of your support along the way. Great work. Okay, questions, comments?
How many of the guest judges understand what Go Local does? Okay, that's right. a problem. Absolutely, so let's explain then. Go Local is an app-based two-sided network that partners travelers with locals who act as their host on site. And so the unique thing about Go Local is that we use an algorithm to match users based on travel personalities. And instead of having a typical tourist experience, what Go Local enables you to do is get all of the behind the scenes place, places that people go. What are the locals doing? Where are they going? The things that we're, they're seeing. So, so my question is, it's, it's like Airbnb then, but with this element of a, a, a hosted private tour experience. My question is, how do you, you, know, how do you uh, incentivize that side of the market? The hosts, you call them, right? What is their monetary gain, and how do you vet the quality to ensure consistency? There will be the monetary benefit. So we did a lot of customer price surveys. It's about $200 for a four-hour tour. And our vetting process is really just, you know, the community. We're going to use people in the community to reach out to people that would want to be hosts. And then we're going to go through a big community process with them where we meet with them, train them. There'll be online videos to be training people. And it's really about the host interests matching with the traveler's interest. Question. So if you go to Airbnb site, they have experiences, which is exactly something that you're doing. So how do you think you're going to compete with a unicorn? So we view Airbnb City Host as one of our biggest competitors. Our differentiator is that these aren't prepackaged items that you could buy, for example, on Groupon, which is what Airbnb is currently offering. These would be items that are totally unique based on the traveler's preferences. If they're a history buff, they can be paired with someone who wants a history-specific tour. They can dictate the length and time if they want to do a restaurant tour, et cetera, et cetera. So these are completely customizable, whereas Airbnbs are prepackaged things. So how do you... I was just on a recent trip, and if you go to, if you wanted to go to a tour of the Eiffel Tower, it's really hard to get tickets because so many of these companies buy up tickets and then turn around and then resell them at 10 times the face value, but they market it as, we're going to give you a tour, which is the same as any audio tour. How do you stop those sort of things from happening? Yeah, and jump in if anyone agrees. Um, so from our perspective, the prices will be all-inclusive, and so what you would determine up front is does it include tickets? Does it include the meal? And from our perspective, we would have a sliding scale based on how much you can charge for all of the things that are included in the package fee. And you're taking a 10% cut. What's the average unit price? For a four-hour experience, $200 is the average. So why do you think that uh, Airbnb would go to Groupon to sell their package deals? So I should clarify. Airbnb doesn't go to Groupon to sell their package deals. They just offer similar experiences. For example, it's a prepackaged, here's a four-hour wine tour that you could do. Like Groupon. Okay. Exactly. They're, the experiences they offer are similar to what you could purchase through Groupon. Do you have a lot of executives for a small company? Who's doing the actual work? All four of us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Go local. Okay, with that, let's pull up the slide uh, that, in, that will tell you where to go to vote. Uh, I just want to remind you again, uh, what you are voting on here is the team that you think is the most likely to be a successful startup, a uh, team that has validated their business model, has identified their milestones and next steps, that understands their challenges, that's gaining traction and scale, and that has that determination to succeed. So what you do is go to this uh, link right here, this bit.ly link. Make sure you use the proper caps. So it's capital TSU finale with the F on finale capitalized. And vote for the team that you think it, uh, should be crowned the one. Incredible progress by each of these teams. We're so thrilled uh, for what they have accomplished. Uh, but without further ado, let's congratulate Morning Brew. How about this? 25 to 40% of the city's electricity is used just for water treatment. 
Clearly, there's a disconnect between us and our water systems. Purely fills this gap. By helping you reduce your water usage, we're shining a light on water issues both at home and abroad. Thank you. All right. <laughs>